This is a Relay Project. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. On this Monday, August 15th, we welcome you to a very special week of shows here on Real Talk as we mark some of our best ofs, as they call them. These are the interviews over the past few months that have really resonated with us. And you've let us know these are the ones that have resonated with you, too. These are the interviews, the conversations that have prompted deeper dives into some of the issues that matter to us, the relevant issues impacting Canadians on an everyday basis. In just a moment, we're going to bring you a recent conversation uh, from back in June with Ben Perrin. Back on June 13th, I spoke to the former advisor to Prime Minister Stephen Harper, an author, a harm reduction advocate, and the author of Overdose, Heartbreak and Hope in Canada's Opioid Crisis, a powerful message about drug decriminalization and harm reduction efforts in Canada. But first, a reminder that interviews like the one you're about to see or hear with Ben Perrin don't happen without the support of our amazing sponsors, like... Apex Automation is putting out the call to engineers across Canada who are looking to make the most of their career and provide intuitive, fully autonomous solutions to industry. Are you dissatisfied where you are now? Do you feel underappreciated? Do you feel like your professional development opportunities are capped? Is there a problem with your corporate culture? Apex Automation could be your next best move. Check him out online at apexautomation.ca. Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge has Alberta's best selection of Chrysler, Jeep, and Ram trucks. You can check them out online or in person today and browse their new and pre-owned selection. Whether you're looking to upsize to make room for a new family member or downsize based on fuel costs, you'll find your perfect fit online or in person at Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge. Local Environmental Services has been providing waste and recycling management services in Alberta and now Saskatchewan for more than a quarter century. They're still family owned. Some people say it's only garbage, but not to local environmental services. They believe communities deserve better. Whether you're looking for water hauling, vacuum truck services, fencing, portable toilets, or front load bins, you can get your quote today at localenvironmental.ca. Our first guest this morning is... uh A man of deep thought and deep conviction, and uh, he evidences that uh, quite often. If you follow him on Twitter, you know this, at Prof. Ben Perrin. Uh, We're going to talk to him in just a second about his editorial that just ran in the Calgary Herald. He's a law professor at the University of British Columbia, author of the national best-selling book, Overdose, Heartbreak and Hope in Canada's Opioid Crisis. It's a pleasure to welcome back to the program Ben Perrin. Thanks for making time for us this morning. And you're you're checking in from Vancouver, aren't you? Yeah, that's right. Thanks. So, for so we want to thank you for waking up early for us as well. It's good to see you. We, we we always sort of gather our thoughts and come together on a Monday. How was your weekend? What does a weekend look like for you and the Perrin family in Vancouver? Uh, yeah, I, I honestly needed a real break. It's been hard the last few um, months. I've been working on a new project, talking to people who've been horrifically affected by the criminal justice system and um, that includes people who are victims of crime people who are uh, offenders have spent you know most of their life in behind bars and um, it's just a, a project that grew out of this extension of research in the opioid crisis so i needed a break it involved jumping in a cold lake having a campfire and some s'mores so that was just what i needed amazing and, and your 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 mind is clear and your heart is full now ready to face another week yeah i think so yeah. <laughs> we'll see Ben, it's interesting like you, uh, you know, you were you served as uh, former Prime Minister Stephen Harper's criminal justice advisor, a lawyer for the PMO. And, it, you know, it, the little bits of language that you use and how you use them are telling and interesting. And I wonder if we can maybe even dig into that. You're telling us about this project you're working on. You say I'm talking to people that are affected by the criminal justice system, um, affected by. And then you're talking to, like you said, victims of crime, people who have have survived, uh, you know, uh, uh, circumstances aren't exactly exactly ideal, but at the same time, people that are incarcerated, people that are doing time, people that have committed the crimes affected by the criminal justice system. Can you take us into that premise? 
Yeah, I mean, I can link it to the the opioid crisis directly too. Um, the fact is that when you look at people who overdosed in in Alberta, for example, uh, Premier Kenny announced last week some statistics which were frankly quite shocking and he seemed to think it helped his argument that we should keep criminalizing people who use drugs he said that 50 percent of albertans who died since 2017 of overdose deaths had uh, recently uh been in provincial uh custody so these are people who were in jail half of the people who've died from overdose uh spent time recently in prison um what that tells us is you know sending people to prison who have opioid use disorder is like a death sentence. Um, this isn't uh, really news though, because we actually have known this. 50% uh, is, is extraordinarily high in, in BC, it's 40%. The British um, the medical journal, peer reviewed articles that we had in our research found that uh, people are at the highest risk of overdose death within two weeks of being released from prison. And why is that? Well, there's still rampant access to drugs in, in prisons. There, there always will be, but there's less access. And so your tolerance, if you have opioid use disorder, rapidly declines. About 70 to 80 percent of people in prison have some form of substance use disorder. And so what that means is when they're released without any kind of supports or any treatment or any plan, and we know this is a chronic relapsing condition, when they do go back to those drugs, I've talked to people who've, who've been released uh, in our research, and they say, I, I use barely anything. One described it as a crime. He said, this isn't going to even do anything. And he overdosed mm -hmm. and he almost died. And so, you know, we know that the criminal justice system is affecting people. It's killing. It's literally killing people. And it is doing that in record numbers in the province of Alberta. So what are we trying to accomplish with criminal law? I thought it was, you know, trying to protect life and property. And yet we see the system having these these devastating effects. I, it's it's almost unfair for me to ask you to speak for somebody else, but what do you think that Alberta's premier was trying to say, or what do you think he was trying to accomplish by invoking that statistic that 50% of those that died from drug poisoning in Alberta had been incarcerated within the last two years? What would be the point of a politician saying that? I have absolutely no idea. I don't think Premier Kenny understands the statistics. He certainly doesn't understand the evidence on this stuff. We can look at his opposition to things like overdose prevention sites. We have over 100 peer-reviewed articles saying that these work, that they're necessary for saving lives, and yet he has uh, cut funding and, and led, led to shutting them down in Alberta. And there is research now that's come out showing that there are escalated uh, deaths occurring in places like Lethbridge, which has one of the highest per capita uh, death rates from overdose uh, in the country and perhaps even the world. And so, you know, this is this is serious stuff. Uh, over 27,000 Canadians have died since 2016 of drug overdose deaths. The research is clear. Criminalizing people who use drugs um, stigmatizes them. It contributes to them using alone. So if they do overdose, there's no one there to help revive them. And it contributes to things like people who are experiencing homelessness or using on the street to use faster. You see the police coming. You know, it doesn't matter that, you know, maybe the police have said, oh, don't worry, we're not going to charge you. But what do the police do? They typically will t take the drugs, crush them under their feet. And then someone who's going through withdrawal is going to go back and try to find drugs however they can at that point. That could include petty crime. That could include selling their bodies, This the survival sex trade, you know, just horrific things. And instead, if we look at what why people use, um, the information that we got now is, you know, it's things like early uh, childhood use, early childhood trauma, you know, peer influence, genetics. And, and bottom line, like anyone who knows anything about addictions knows you can't just stop using. That's like the definition of an addiction. So threatening someone with jail time or they're going to take their substances, that that doesn't stop people from using. It just causes them to use more risky and contributes to their death. Mm. We've we've been talking about this on the show for people that are maybe just dropping in on this conversation, wondering about context. The province of British Columbia has essentially secured a, a temporary. What do we want to call it? Like a, a, a relaxation of or an immunity from what's the technical what's the legal phrase, Professor, from from the government of Canada? Yeah, it's an exemption. An so exemption. They're, yeah. So there's a, you know, it's a crime to possess uh, any quantity of so-called hard drugs. So things like heroin or fentanyl, which is a synthetic opioid, cocaine, methamphetamine, MDMA, all this sort of stuff. I, I didn't know anything about any of these drugs. Okay. I'll tell you, I didn't. All right. As far as I understood was, you know, alcohol and cannabis. That was about it. I had to learn about this stuff and it sounded scary. And one of the things I learned though, was that fentanyl, which is a synthetic opioid, which is driving the opioid crisis. It's found in the vast majority of toxicology reports post-mortem 
is it's a synthetic drug. It's made in a lab. And so I did some more digging and it was actually, it's an old drug. It was made in the 19, late 1950s. And why do they create this thing? It was for palliative cancer patients. It's for people who are dying. It's to relieve their pain. And it's used widely now in veterinary settings, in medical settings. I went through a medical procedure where I was sedated uh, a couple of years ago after I wrote this book, Overdose. And uh, I asked them as I was going under, I said, hey, what are you giving me? And I just was curious. And they said, well, it's, it's fentanyl. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I guess I got my chance to try fentanyl. Yeah. So I've tried fentanyl and uh, you know, in a medical setting. And I'll tell you why it's it was completely and totally safe. There's two reasons. One is it was of known uh, potency and contents. Like literally they're being titrated by the drop, right? So that's number one. Number two is there was someone there who knew what to do if I was given too much that could revive me. It's totally safe. Both of those things are missing. We have people overdosing and dying. So the toxic street drug supply is wild west. When I interviewed undercover police officers and vice squads who go in and do these busts, they literally found kitchen blenders being used to mix in fentanyl, which is toxic and deadly to someone who's an occasional first time user when you're talking about a grain more or a grain less of sand. That's the quantities. They're mixing it with the kitchen blender. So zero quality control. And you never know what you're getting. And it's contaminated. We've we've found fentanyl in every, I shouldn't say we, I don't go test them, but the police do drug buys. They go undercover and test the drugs. They've found fentanyl in everything that you can buy on the street. It's not like, oh, I was just looking for ecstasy or cocaine. It's the chances are there's probably some fentanyl in there too, because it's cheap, it's potent and that. So when we lose the the ability to know what's in our, these drugs that people are going to use anyway, it is like playing Russian roulette. And again, when you criminalize something, you encourage people to use alone. And uh, when they uh, they do, you know, relapse if they're even in recovery, and there there's the stigma around I can't you know use again, and the secrecy around it. That's when people die. We have people who've died in recovery centers that were abstinence-based recovery centers because they didn't have any other kind of support, and they they had the weight of their family and everyone saying, yeah, you can do this, you can do this. And, and they, when they do relapse, they die. And the reason for that is because again, their tolerance has gone down and they're just not able to process that quantity of drugs. And if you've got car fentanyl, I mean, people can Google that and learn about that, which is just like, what do you want to call it? It's like turbo fentanyl, quite frankly. And, and, and then people will make these arguments for safe supply, right? Which yeah. I don't, I don't think it's a completely different conversation than what we're having. I mean, this all needs to be kind of one big conversation, doesn't it? Like federally and then by the provinces or, 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 or I mean, I'm just even keeping the conversation to Canada right now. I mean, this is a problem around the world, the opioid is, crisis yeah. and the drug poisoning. You know, you, you talk to even people on, on like the law enforcement side when it comes to customs, when it comes to trying to keep this stuff out. The, the majority of it, or at least a lot of it coming from China. I remember talking to someone from Cal Canada Border Services quite some time ago, and they said one of the biggest challenges about this is that heroin. Uh, cocaine used to come in on pallets, right? Like big, huge bricks. Yeah. And, you know, th th there's enough fentanyl to kill a thousand people in, in something. Uh, the phrase they used, which stuck with me, was, was in a pencil case. You know, they mm. said that you can import enough to kill a thousand people in a pencil case. It makes it a lot tougher on the on the enforcement side. Um, I, I think it's worth revisiting the political side of this because even... And I'll let you make the point, not me. I mean, I'm citing your piece that ran in the Calgary Herald. People can read it for themselves. Ran on uh, June the 8th opinion. I used to agree with Kenny and Poliev on criminalizing drug, use, but, uh, drug users, but I was wrong. Uh, those are your words. Yeah. The Canadian Association of the Chiefs of Police even support small amounts of decriminalization. Yet here are the politicians chiming in. And, and I want to read just a portion of the statement that was released by Alberta's premier when B.C. made the announcement. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see it for yourself. If you're listening on the podcast, I'll describe for you. There's this big banner across the top, like almost like a letterhead, but not the not the party's colors of, of, of blue uh, and not. I mean, it's 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 bright red and, and orange. It's shocking. It's almost the sort of font you'd expect for like a, a you know, smoky says only you can prevent forest fires, kind of a real sort of crime and punishment type vibe. Uh, the photo behind it superimposed over a photo of a bunch of needles at the bottom of a kid's playground slide. Um, and says the, the premier of Alberta, who resigned a while ago, but still holding office, quote, as a neighboring province, the government of Alberta is alarmed by this announcement to decriminalize. We will be monitoring the situation very closely. I want to state in the strongest possible terms the, to the government of Canada, the government of British Columbia, that Alberta will exhaust all options should your actions cause damage to Albertans, uh, which is kind of an interesting bit of saber rattling. And, and then you've got the, the front runner. Uh, most are calling him the heir apparent. 
uh, to the leadership of the federal conservative party, Pierre Polyev, tweeting this in response to the news as well. Uh, says Mr. Polyev, decriminalizing deadly drug use is the opposite of compassionate. Uh, those struggling with addiction need treatment and recovery. Drug dealers need strong policing and tough sentences. It's a line that's worked in conservative politics around the world, quite frankly. The crime and punishment yeah. idea, the lock them up idea, the get them off the streets idea, right? And, right. and your views used to align with that right up to the PMO. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty basic logic, if you think of it, right? If something is harmful to people, we should criminalize it. I'll tell you what, Ryan, that's as deep as the thinking goes in terms of conservative drug policy. Like, there's nothing behind it. And they know that it wins them votes. They not only um, uh, are able to scare people and rile up fear among voters, uh, they stigmatize and demonize people who use drugs. Um, but they even fundraise off it. I mean, there were there's examples in my book of that taking place. I mean, I think it's 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 sick and it's wrong. Um, what changed my views? I mean, what well, how did I go from that ideology to actually looking at what would work, what would help people? Uh, it was talking to people who had used drugs. It was talking to the police. You mentioned the Canadian Chiefs of Police Association. They now support decriminalizing uh, small amounts of drugs for for possession. So it's kind of ironic that you have a candidate like uh, Pierre Polyev saying, you know, we're going to make Canada the freest country in the world, but he actually wants to criminalize something that the police say should be legal. Like, what? Let's, let's do a double take there. I mean, not all conservatives think the way that Kenny and Polyev do. I mean, the Cato Institute in the U.S. is an example of a libertarian think tank that supports drug decriminalization. They've done that for, uh, for close to a decade now. Uh, William Hague, who is the former leader of the Conservative Party in the U.K., supports decriminalizing drug possession. Um, you know, the Fraser Institute published a review of my book where they were offering as strong of an endorsement as they could of, of drug decriminalization. And, you know, at the end of the day, when I talked about 27,000 people dying of drug overdoses, they don't like you don't check your you know political views and then say whether you overdose or not. That runs the spectrum. So, you know, whether you're a conservative voter, liberal, NDP, green, whatever, you know, you probably know someone who's died. Um, and if we don't start thinking about why these politicians are saying what they're doing, we're in big trouble. And enough people know someone who is affected by substances to, to, to understand that this is not something anyone chooses. And by threatening them with incarceration, by stigmatizing and demonizing them, that makes this worse. We tried Kenny and Polyev's approaches of cranking up penalties. Some countries uh, have life imprisonment or the death penalty for people who who uh, are involved in illicit drugs. You know what the research shows? It doesn't help. It does not deter. Increasing penalties does not deter. But what it does do is cost billions of dollars. So if you like flushing money down toilets, like let's keep doing what we're doing. And <clears throat> we know that um, the cracking down on the so-called supply has actually only made it worse. You know, you mentioned the CVSA. I talked to them as well. There's 1.9 million packages from China coming into Canada every year. Yeah. And they find fentanyl in greeting cards. You mentioned pencil cases. They found it in greeting cards as well, like Ziploc baggies. Okay. So we're never going to find this. Um, you know, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. And guess what? If you do remember, I mentioned synthetic drug. You can make fentanyl with college level chemistry equipment and supplies. That's something I confirmed. Uh, from the uh, Livermore National Security Lab in the States. I actually went on line, Ryan, you could do this just for, for your own fun and try to find a fentanyl recipe. I found one in five minutes, not just found one. I verified it was legitimate. And when I called that lab up, they verified for me. They said, yeah, you could totally use this. You could use legally available chemicals. So if we want to start cracking down on the border and locking up more drug traffickers, like go at it. The research shows that's only going to increase potency and lower costs. So if we're done wasting money and having people die, let's start looking at what the research shows would work. Man, you remember when, uh, what was this? I mean, it was probably 15, 20 years ago. The argument for shutting down the internet was that there was the, uh, what do they call the terrorist handbook? There was a recipe yeah. for building a pipe bomb and people just wanted to shut down the entire internet. And right now here we are doing this live streaming and, and you're right. And I am not laughing, but I am researched. Yeah. Geez. There it is. Ingredients and cutting agents, how to make fentanyl. Wow. Uh, so Ben, like in straight talk, real talk here. Now people are going to say, and these are just average folks. These aren't people that are malicious. These aren't people that, that want to just necessarily lock up folks that need help. But a lot of a lot of just average, you know, John and Jill Q public, so to speak, will sit here and say, but hang on a second, you guys, it sounds to me like, you know, you're, you're, you're just advocating like giving up like it like it's harder to patrol our borders. It's harder. To, so we just so we just 
open it up and just let people use drugs. And what you know, they hear arguments about safe supply. Well, what are you saying, Professor Perrin? You're saying we should just give people hard drugs? You say we should just have these lounges where we can just go do hard drugs? Like, what? It just sounds like sort of like, you know, one of the signs that Sports Illustrated would say, one of the signs that the apocalypse is upon us. Like, how do you make that message understandable, palatable? How do you make it make sense to the average citizen that, that doesn't do the research you do, that hasn't been in those meetings, that hasn't interviewed people at the highest level that are trying to address this opioid crisis? How, how do you put this at a, at a ground level where the average person can understand what you're advocating for? So I was there. I would start by saying that all of those things you said, Ryan, those were literally the same questions I had. I did not start out researching the opioid crisis thinking I'd be the one here saying we need to decriminalize drugs, have a safe supply and, you know, all that stuff. So I would say uh, check my book out. Like if you're if you're skeptical or if you know someone who's skeptical about the need to decriminalize drugs or provide a safe supply, literally, like you'll see the chapter titles of the book. Here, I got a, I got a copy here. I'll read you just one or two of them and you'll get a sense of kind of I was there. Here's chapter 11 is providing safe drugs, giving up on people. Mm. OK. You know, do supervised injection sites enable drug use? Won't decriminalize and make decriminalization make things worse? Those are chapter titles. So, you know, I, I get it. And that's where I was. So I would say walk that road and talk to people um, that you uh, know with some compassion who maybe use drugs and you might find uh, you might find something surprising. The other thing I would say is we need to listen to the surviving family members of people who have died from overdose deaths. That is not what uh, Premier Kenny and uh, Pierre Pauly are, are doing at all. I mean, when you look at the sort of leading national advocacy group supporting um, these these surviving family members, Mom Stop the Harm is the, mm. the name of them. People can look them up. Great organization. They not only do advocacy, but grief support. They run support groups for people who've you know lost their, their loved ones. And they are calling for decriminalization. You know, those 27,000 people who died, the law, Premier Kenny and Pierre Pauly have considered them to be criminals. I, I don't agree with them. I, I don't. I say they're dearly, dearly loved people who deserved better, who deserved some compassion and some understanding. And if you had someone in your life who was addicted to a substance that could kill them, threatening them with jail is, is cruel. It is heartless. It does not help them in any way. So we've got to examine our own hearts. We've got to ask, why are we having this reaction? You know, Lock them up, throw away the key, send them to jail. What I see that's just driven by is fear. We're just afraid and we, we don't know what to do. So we come back hard with some uh, some harsh policies and uh, fear wins a lot of votes. It's sad, but it's true. And look, there is going to be accountability uh, at some point. I, I know for all of the senseless loss of life here. And we're way past the point where people can say, I didn't know. I love that you give us the assignment to examine our hearts. I always envision, I don't know, because we're, we're, we're a dog family. We have, so I do, I spend a lot of time listening to podcasts, doing a lot of my thinking on dog walks. And, I, and I'm thinking of somebody right now with their headphones in that's walking their dog that's listening to this just in their own thoughts, examining their own heart. You don't have to be up on a, behind a lectern. You don't have to be up on a debate stage, but just to examine your own heart on this like you've done. Um, and it's a powerful exercise. You know, you keep referencing these 27,000 human beings who've lost their lives in Canada to drug poisoning. I also think it's worth pointing out that's a, that's a number since 2016, right? That's yeah. that's yeah. six years. That's not in human. That's not in recorded human history. That's in the last six years. Twenty seven thousand people Two hockey arenas full almost. Let, let, let's put it that way. Uh, you don't let the prime minister up before somebody says, oh, oh, this is this is a, you know, a PMO stat. This is a this is a, a Harper uh, top advisor that, that's gone rogue. And, uh, you know, this is a political exercise or this is a political attack. You don't let the prime minister off the hook. In fact, no. in, in, in your opinion <laughs> piece in the Herald, you include Justin Trudeau's name, right? You say yeah. you say that's what's wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm riffing here, but my paraphrase is you basically say that's what's wrong with Pierre Polyev Jason Kenney and Justin Trudeau outside of BC. So let's take a look at the federal government and what your expectations are there. Yeah, it's you're absolutely right. And in my book, I spend more time criticizing Prime Minister Trudeau actually at the end than anyone else. Um, I think Jason Kenney and Premier Doug Ford in Ontario, they make some cameos in the book as well. But uh, I did some research into this. We got, uh, I had three cabinet ministers in the end and uh, BC provincial government official 
and I mentioned Mom Stop the Harm, uh, all confirmed for me in, in confidential meetings they had with uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, the reason that he provided for why he would not decriminalize drugs was because of the politics. He's, he'd faced so much blowback when he legalized uh, cannabis. And just pausing here to say, we're not talking about legalizing drugs, we're talking about decriminalizing them, which is totally different. It's not punishing people, that's what we're talking about today. But his reasons for not doing it were political. So he's he's just as guilty as, uh, as the other uh, people we've been talking about of putting politics above lives in my view. And when I wrote to his office about those allegations, they never bothered to even reply, okay? So uh, he's on the hook too. His party voted against a, a private member's bill just two weeks ago that would have decriminalized drugs across the country, which is what we need to do, not just in BC, not just for three years, not just for adults, and not just for a small quantity of, uh, of infinitesimal quantity of, of substances. So yeah, we need to turn the page on this global war on drugs. And you're right, it is a global issue. Well over half a million people die from drug overdose globally. And the world is slowly starting to get glimpses emerging from the fog of this global war on drugs. And um, people are taking note. I mean, I've done interviews this week with, uh, and last week with, with BBC, with uh, AFP in France and Israeli news network. Uh, this morning there's an article in Wired if people are interested to read it out. Do the research, yeah, look into this stuff. What you're gonna find is that there's no evidence there's no evidence to back what Premier Jason Kenney is saying on his his ideas about drug policy. It's, you know, maybe he needs to take some time to look into that. I've written to him personally about that, and I've, I'm not going to disparage him, although there's a lot of strong feelings I have towards what he's doing because his policies are contributing to killing people. Um, but he needs to search his heart, you know. And I wrote to him, actually, he's a professing uh, Catholic. I am not Catholic, but I'm a professing Christian. And I wrote to him on that basis. And I have a problem sharing that publicly because he's had an opportunity personally to do it with me. And, you know, one of the things it says in, in the Bible is if you confront someone who claims to be following Jesus, you do it privately and they don't, they don't turn, turn their ways. You're supposed to do it publicly. It actually says that. But I called him out on it. And it's devastating to me to see the amount of um, vitriol and hatred being directed towards people who use drugs. You know, I had a real moment when researching my book, many moments that were quite profound for me. One of them was when I, I came across a study that said the most stigma that globally we have for people, and in Canada, they did a survey, was for people who use drugs. Those are the people we hate the most. That's what stigma means, basically. Social opprobrium, right? Outcast. The most was people who use drugs. More than people who even had leprosy, which some people in some countries still have. And so, you know, as someone who 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 is a follower of, of of Christ, I look at that and I go, he touched people with leprosy. You know, he had dinners with with prostitutes and tax collectors who were traders, right? And the 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 finger wagging, you know, Pharisees and teachers of the law of that day said, Who is this guy? Like he spends time having dinner with these people? Doesn't he know who they were? If he knew who they were, he wouldn't have anything to do with them. I got news for for people. If, if, if Jesus Christ were walking the face of the earth in flesh today, he would be in places like the downtown east side in Vancouver. He would be in places like Skid Row in whatever city you're in. He would be there. And he'd be also be in our churches, I believe, calling us out for being a bunch of hypocrites for not uh, having softer hearts, hearts of compassion. You know, I'm grateful he didn't pick up stones and, and stone the woman caught in adultery. He told others, hey, if you're, with, if you're so hot, you throw the first stone. That's my challenge to people. You know, if you think you've never done anything wrong or hurtful or harmful to yourself or others, you'd be the one to pick up the first stone of criminalization and throw it at people who use drugs. I can't do that. I step back and I go, man, I'm going to walk away and look at my own life and think about how could we show some compassion and bring some healing for people and not just judge and condemn them. So, you know, some people are uncomfortable talking about religion, but I think it's important because we have leaders who claim to be, you know, uh, Christian or of other faiths, and they rile up voters. And, you know, I've heard people from the Pew talk, well, we've got to support the right people. Well, you know, it, this is not the approach that I see as being one of meekness, gentleness, compassion, right? Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Are we showing compassion, mercy, when we criminalize people who use drugs? Absolutely not. So, I didn't want to interrupt you one, but I was like, I will listen to this preaching all day. Um, and I'm having like a, I, first of all, do you have to go? No. Okay, good. So my kids burst down the door. looking. For okay, sweet. I'm here. Great. Okay, perfect. Because, uh, because I, I kind of like, you're, you're, you're kicking up a whole bunch of stuff in my brain 
uh, which I appreciate. And I and, and part of me goes, well, don't take this too far off track. And then part of me goes, that's kind of the whole point of this show is to be able to really dig into stuff and really talk about it. And I think of of some of even in, in my own life, Ben, and like looking back on some of the and I've talked about this on the show before, like some of the, the horrible jokes I would tell about groups of people when I was young and stupid and sure. and in high school and even into university and the way that I would judge people either external, like outwardly and audibly or not or internally or the way that it shaped my perspectives. And I would just sort of you'd look at someone like destitute. You'd look at someone on the street. You'd look at someone. You know, there was it was obvious that they used drugs and you'd, you'd, you'd sort of like claim this high ground, right? Like this yeah. kind of moral high ground, no understanding of trauma, no understanding of the impact of abuse, no understanding about these cycles like you talk about of in and out of the criminal justice. I mean, just no understanding of any of it, just this blind uh, what is it? I mean, it, it's just this sort of sense of superiority, really. It's this yeah. it's a, it's an egotistical um, unaware, like it's just a, a, you know, and then the more you learn, I mean, we've even been going through this exercise, I think as a, as a community on this show. And, and I think Canadians in general, uh, with regards to the, to the, the reminders, I don't call them revelations, but the reminders, uh, about the Canada's residential schools and, and the mm. horrific things that happened there. And then we look at the disproportionate number of indigenous people in Canada that are, that are both, uh, homeless, uh, and, and that are represented in the criminal justice system as well. And we wonder why, like yeah. the answer's right in front of us. That's right. right? But at the yeah. same time, but, but it's, but, but we claim the high ground, right? It becomes more about like choices, right? This is what everybody right. talks about <laughs> choices. Some people didn't have the choice. Yeah. And you know, you're absolutely right. Like we want to start looking at who's responsible for what's going on. We should probably be looking in the mirror, mm. you know, what the, the research shows about uh, drug use, let's focus on that. Yeah, there's a direct line from the residential school system to uh, people turning to substances. The research shows that someone who has experienced moderate to severe early childhood trauma, I'm talking about things like physical and sexual abuse, neglect, um, separation from your parents, incarceration of a, a parent, um, experiencing or witnessing family violence. There's a whole list of 10 of these things are called ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. Someone who's had uh, at least five of those, so kind of a moderate level of them, they're seven to 10 times more likely to develop a substance use disorder, okay? Seven to 10 times more. The average uh, person who attended residential schools was found in a study to have experienced over six ACEs, okay? Hmm. And so that that draws a direct line. Again, the last residential school didn't close until 1996. And you also find that there are intergenerational impacts of this and the research shows that and confirms that too and um yeah i mean you, you look at this it's not like cry i talk about this in my class i teach criminal law right and i say you know if, i used to watch star i'll admit it right i was geek i probably still am you don't become a professor of being a bit of a geek right I, I used to watch star trek any other trekkies out there okay um there was an episode where it was called the watchers and the idea was that the uh, the Federation was would watch these, uh, you know, alien uh, species or, or civilizations to try to study them. And once they got to a certain point, they would make contact, but they were studying them to learn about them before they would, you know, make contact and, and learn their language, presumably in customs and stuff like that. And it struck me once, you know, I was thinking, what if what if we were imagine we were being watched, right? One of the things that, uh, you know, an alien life form would notice is that some people are locked in these cages and other people are free to go about their business. And they would wonder why that is. That would be puzzling, right? That would be kind of, they would want to know why. Why do some people get locked in these cages and they're not allowed to leave? And I'll tell you what they would not conclude. They would not conclude that people who commit crimes are the people who spend time in cages. Why? Because first of all, the vast majority of crime doesn't even get reported. Secondly, there's a massive disparity between who goes to jail and who commits crime. You're way less likely to go to prison if you can afford a lawyer. Uh, I spoke to a, a leading uh, criminal defense lawyer in your province for my recent study. And I, I'm not going to spoil the next book, which I'm writing, but I can just tell you that I heard some pretty shocking, tough, real talk from him about how money gets you off charges. Mm. And that may not sound as a shock to people, but to hear that from a lawyer in the system with dollar values attached to it, I said to him, hey, look, I, you know, I make a pretty good salary. I'm not a super wealthy guy. I live in Vancouver. My money all goes into my mortgage. Yeah. But if, but I'd need to keep my job. If I got charged with something and I got, I got conviction for it, I mean, I'd, I'd probably lose my job and may get disbarred, right? So it'd be a big deal. But I said, imagine I take out some home equity and come to you 
what could you do for me on drug charges? And he said, well, we have to, you know, X, Y, and Z. And basically he's like, yeah, we would, we'd be able to do something for you. Someone who does not have the means is going to plead out and they're going to get a criminal record. And over time that's going to accumulate. and They're going to end up going to jail. So, you know, getting back to this idea of being watched by aliens and why are we incarcerating some people, not others? It's not that the people who commit crimes go to jail. What they would conclude is it's a combination of being indigenous or black, poor, uneducated, and having mental health and substance uses. Pick two of five, basically, and those are the people who we lock up in these cages. You uh, are you seeing a difference, like in 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 the lawyers, whether they're prosecutors or whether they're criminal defense lawyers uh, of today and tomorrow, versus who maybe you went yeah. to law school with? Is there a different approach or a different perspective that you notice? Well, let me tell you, this is pretty cool stuff. Um, I know two uh, former federal drug prosecutors personally who have quit their jobs because they do not want blood on their hands anymore. Wow. Okay. And this university that I, I teach and work out of, UBC, we issued a, a public apology in the uh, ongoing wake of the residential schools um, uh, issue, apologizing for our role as a university for educating teachers who taught in residential schools, okay? That the university saw that it was complicit because it was teaching people who went, worked in these places. I have no doubt that one day this university and others will or should be apologizing for the role of, of graduating thousands upon thousands of lawyers who served as functionaries in the criminal justice system that contributed to these ongoing harms. Uh, it is it is toxic stuff. And uh, the way I teach my students now is we start from square one. We learn the law. They learn the law very well. I mean, I used to work at the Supreme Court of Canada, PMO. I, I know criminal law. I teach it. They learn it. They do great on exams, but they don't just learn the nuts and bolts of law. Uh, this year, I taught them all about the stuff we're talking about. We had criminologists come in. We had addictions physicians come in. We had crown prosecutors come in. We had indigenous and black scholars come in. They heard from experts about how the system is affecting people. And we talk about what are some other ways we could do this. Um, and that's what my next project is about. How could we reimagine the criminal justice system to deal with things? Because we know people harm others. We have to deal with that. We can't just pretend it doesn't happen. But this idea of using punishment and incarceration as our way to solve it, it actually only makes it, it worse is what we found. You should. I'm already looking forward to your next book. You should see what's happening in our live chat right now. I, I was I was uh, neglecting it because I'm just like present with you, Ben. Um, but there's people testifying here. This is amazing. There's pe people are people are sharing their own tragic stories of loss. Um, they've lost siblings, cousins. Uh, people are talking about their own personal perspectives, how they've evolved. I mean, you, you, you're helping That's awesome. move people's hearts this morning. And, and this audience does its own thing, too. I'm just, I am just just feel honored and privileged to be able to hang out with this audience every single day. Uh, ben, we've kept you. So we're closing in. We, you and I have been talking for like almost 45 minutes now. So I got to let you go. This is, I mean, time just, this just happens like this. And it's amazing. I wanted to touch on a couple things before we do. And I'm so grateful for your time. Brent Whitmire, you may know who he is, a former uh, retired journalist. Let me say he's a university professor or just a, a really thoughtful, contemplative guy. I think we've maybe touched on this. I think you've maybe answered this already, but he's watching and he wants me to ask you if the evidence really matters uh, on drug policy, on criminal justice, on decriminalizing drugs. Does the evidence really matter to the, the capital C conservative movement or if the class interests and appeal to be, quote, tough on crime is too great that they'll continue to pursue failed policy for electoral gain? Uh, I think we've kind of addressed that already. Uh, that's kind of a succinct way to put it, isn't it? Yeah, I think he's hit the nail on the head there. I think it's clear the evidence does not matter. Um, produce the evidence for their policies. That there is none. The evidence is all on the other side. And we're at the point now where I look at things like uh, the example of you know overdose prevention sites. Like I said, there's over 100 peer-reviewed articles supporting um, those that they save lives, that they can be done well, and um, can actually reduce disruption in the community. One of the problems in Alberta was you, you know you have one overdose prevention site and well that's where all the people are going to go and you know Mary he uh then she in calgary had said at the time like my problem wasn't having uh one it was that i didn't have more right you need more places so yeah. it's not concentrating everyone right so just to bring that up well would another 200 or one or 200 peer-reviewed studies have helped convince premier kenny what do you think ryan i don't think it would have you know so we're, we're past the point of this being about evidence it's ideology it's ideology ideology are are deeply held opinions people have, and you can't change people's opinions with facts. And so what speaks to politicians? Well, 
you know, we got to start to change the needle. Uh, the majority of Canadians now actually support uh, decriminalizing drugs. Uh, I was uh, confidentially given some information about internal polling that the you, uh, the United Conservative Party has done on uh, decriminalizing drug use. And so they're polling on this stuff and they're following, you know, kind of where their party's going and that there's still a lot of people really, really opposed to it, even though a lot of people kind of support it. So what that tells me, if I kind of put the political hat on, is that people who are supportive of changing the broken way that we're dealing with our a drug policy, um, you know, need to get more vocal. Um, they need to be uh, doing that in all the kinds of ways that people get politically active. And people are on the fence. I'd really encourage you. This is a this is the a leading issue right now. I mean, this is the number one cause of death in provinces like BC and Alberta. Uh, that's that's not like diabetes and, and heart disease. You know, in my province, it, it's killing more people than homicide, suicide, car accidents, and pharmaceutical overdoses combined. combined. Illicit drugs are the leading cause. Combined, if you add them all yeah. up. And so, you know, what are we doing here? Like as a society, these politicians, like. Are they just there to collect a paycheck? Like I thought, you know, keeping people alive would be a good place to start. If we had a toxic water supply that killed 27,000 people in the last, you know, five, six years, we'd be doing a lot about that. Well, maybe Look unless what, it was on reserves, right? Well, great point. Yeah. yeah. Who's dying? Who's dying? Who's and, dying? You know, right. Like if you look at the, if you look at the, at, at, at drug poisoning deaths uh, stacked up against COVID deaths, uh, the numbers are actually strikingly similar. I know you know that yeah. already. Yeah, well, I'm glad you brought that up. I mean, in BC, we actually had more people die of overdose deaths during the, the first uh, lockdown than of COVID. And so, you know, it is true that disproportionately um, Indigenous, poor, and, and other racialized folks are, uh, and people who serve time are dying. But it is also true that it is, it, this knows no sociodemographic background. And so, you know, just to paint that picture, I've, I've just spoken to family members who were in, like senior government officials federally who, you know, literally went to wake up their 20 something year old daughter one morning and found her deceased. They had no idea she was using drugs. OK, and so we need to realize that this affects um, all of us in, in, in different ways. And so, yeah, we could keep going on and I'd love to come back on and talk about the next book and, and this topic anytime, because I'm just thrilled that you are tackling this in a real way and that you're calling out um, the garbage that's happening and being, you know, fed to us as policy when it's actually killing people. You know, the last thing I'd say, right, I could go right now, I'm 10 minutes from the downtown east side from my house. I could go and buy fentanyl or car fentanyl, no problem. I would have to look for weeks to find unpasteurized milk. <laughs> All right. That tells me something here. Okay. Yeah. You know, like let's make this safe for people to keep them alive. That's the bottom line. Just let's keep people alive. Then they can get into treatment and recovery and some evidence-based treatment and recovery, not just stop using, you know, more kind of, it's all on you to fix your problem. No, that's the whole idea about like, it's the same sort of a thing. You know, I mean, I got to be careful in comparing all these, but it's like telling somebody that's living with depression to like, just be happy. Just yeah. fo focus on the positives. <laughs> like, OK, yeah. uh, by the way, with regards to you coming back, to talk about your new book, we'll do that tomorrow, whatever you want. Door is always open. Surely on our live chat right now says uh, Professor Perrin needs to come back once a month to continue this conversation. Let me ask you, let, let's try to do this in like one minute and then we'll let you go. We've, we've kept you way over our ask and we value your time. Is there is there anything that sort of raises concern with you or is there is there anything you're keeping an eye on with regards to how the federal government has approached this decriminalization, let's call it a pilot in BC. Yeah. Is there anything that's kind of you're going, well, let's wait and see about this part? Yeah, there's there's four things. One is it should have been done nationally, right? Um, we know that there are people across the country who are being harmed by criminalization of drugs still. So this should have been a national decriminalization of simple possession. Uh, secondly, the uh, BC pilot only applies to people over 18. So if you're under 18 and that's when most people start using drugs, you're still a criminal. So have fun. Uh, that's that's wrong. Uh, this shouldn't be criminalized for youth as well as uh, adults should be across the board. Um, yeah, number three is it's limited to uh, 2.5 uh, grams, which was set. We've now found out publicly uh, the federal government said was basically the police uh, said like that should be the number instead of listening to public health experts and people who use drugs who say that's too low and it's just going to lead to them continuing to be criminalized and, and it encourages actually more potent drugs, right? If I can carry two and a half grams legally, but if I go over that, it's it's criminal. Well, then I probably want some more potent stuff, right? So it's creating incentives for that. 
And then finally, it's got, uh, I call it a zombie, it's a zombie exemption. It's only in place for three years. Yeah. And it can be revoked at any minute. So, you know, Pierre Pollock says he's opposed to this. If he, you know, wins the party, you know, leadership and becomes prime minister, you know, every indication is this is not a, I don't think I'm stretching. You read a statement. I mean, I think every indication is he doesn't support this. So he could revoke it the days, you know, sworn in. So th- this is tentative. It's half baked. It's, it's kind of a half measure. It's, it's politics. It's doing the bare minimum that Trudeau thought he could do to get away with this. And it's, it's not enough. So, you know, I, I do firmly believe that we are going to see the decriminalization of people who use drugs in our in our lifetime. I hope that. And if it's not through the politicians because of changing public views, I, it'll be through the courts because this is also unconstitutional. You can't have laws that are killing people for no good reason. That is that is that violates your right to life. Professor Ben Perrin, uh, formerly a lawyer and senior advisor to the Prime Minister Stephen Harper in the PMO. He's a law professor at the University of British Columbia, author of the national best-selling book, Overdose, Heartbreak and Hope in Canada's Opioid Crisis. Ben, thanks so much for your perspective. This is a, a powerful conversation. We're so grateful you've made time to have it right here on Real Talk. Thanks, Ryan. Take care. You know, I've had a chance to interview Ben several times now, and every single time our paths cross, I learn something more, something that further deepens my understanding of just how serious this opioid crisis is, but also how solvable it is if we really put our minds to it and if we rely on evidence along the way. Sometimes easier said than done, I guess. Coming up in just a moment, we're going to revisit a conversation we had back on May 11th with the co-hosts of the Anthropomania podcast, Jay Ingram and Nikki Wilson. Should we de-extinct animals if we can? Would you like to see the woolly mammoth back in action present day? Of course, there's a lot that goes into it, and we have a great conversation. You'll want to stay tuned for that. But first, a word from our sponsors like Eden Landscaping is bringing outdoor spaces to life. In fact, that's what they've been doing for more than 20 years. Mike and his team are experts from modern to traditional design and everything in between. Their projects have one thing in common happy clients. You can check out their portfolio online today at landscapeedmonton.ca and take the first step toward bringing your outdoor space to life with Eden Landscaping. The Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park want to remind you they have a brand new signature stack burger collection ready for you to check out. Of course, all the classic favorites like that Dairy Queen double cheeseburger and some of the new ones like the signature steakhouse stacker with that onion ring on top. Of course, the big lineup of Blizzard speaks for itself. And don't forget to grab a box of Buster Bars the next time you're at the Dairy Queens in Palisades, Nemeo, New Newcastle, Westmount, and Baseline Road. For more than 65 years, Friesen Brothers has been putting really great food on family tables across the province of Alberta. Still family-owned, Friesen Brothers is a proud member of 16 different communities, where on the first of the month, you can take 15% off every grocery order of more than $75. Friesen Brothers, Alberta grown, Alberta owned. In just a second, we will talk to the hosts of this podcast, Anthropomania. But first, we want to give you an idea. There they all are. Look at those. They're ready to go. The hosts locked and loaded. First, Johnny, why don't we tee up what this is all about? Here's the podcast everybody's talking about. Check, check, check. Here we go. The cop fly is one of the most remarkable plants on the planet, I think. It's it's a real science fiction monster. Are nature documentaries good for nature? What I really remember about it is there was a lot of, like, lion on zebra. A lot of death. And Jacques Cousteau was doing a film about the Amazon, and there was a definite tension between the film crew and the biologist. Anyone who works in the field knows that the idea of simplifying a lot of these topics to 30 seconds or less is near impossible. Our next episode is actually going to be extraordinary. Chickens sing the egg song. And if you don't know what the egg song is, it goes like this. (laughs) This is a whole new season too. 
In true anthropomania fashion, we are putting the human relationship with other living things under the microscope. So I've got a smile smeared across my face, and you probably do too, as we welcome the hosts of this podcast to Real Talk, making their debut, Nikki Wilson and Jay Ingram. It's so good to see you both. Thanks for making time for us this morning. Thanks for having us. We should say longtime listener, first time caller. Well, I appreciate that very much. <laughs> this is this yeah, yeah. is the new space, isn't it? And uh, yeah. this is how Canadians and people around the world are 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 learning more and accessing their information and, and asking big questions. And it and it's so exciting to have some fellow movers and shakers in the mm-hmm. podcast space joining us. Jay, your voice, we heard it in the trailer. Are nature documentaries good for nature? Are nature podcasts good for nature? How do you approach the question? Well, I would just approach the question by saying, of course they are, <laughs> and that's why we're doing it. And, you know, our we like to think that our take is a little bit unusual in that, as Nikki said in the promo, uh, we're always looking very carefully at how humans interact with wildlife because many of the problems that we face uh, regarding nature have to do with the fact that we can't stop do- projecting our emotions, our feelings, We think some animals are cute. We think some animals are vicious, whereas they're just really doing their thing. And um, sometimes it's good that we uh, want animals to be like us. And sometimes it's bad. Nikki, what does it mean to you to to apply a a human lens on nature? How do you approach this this storytelling? Yeah, well, it gives us a chance to really dig into some of the issues people hear about every day in a new and interesting way. So, for example, you take something like urban coyotes in Edmonton, and I'm sure you've heard a lot about that. Um, But it allows us to look at people's perspectives and the role they play in that issue. And it allows us to look at human behavior and the role that we are playing in exacerbating that issue. So it's not just reporting on it. It's really kind of digging in and getting to the heart of some of those things. Yeah, well, urban coyotes. I mean, we're out walking our dogs and we live relatively close to the city center. And it's not unusual for us to see coyotes out for a stroll down the sidewalk in broad daylight. It's it's not unusual at all. And people go, well, number one, yeah, uh, coyotes thrive in urban environments. Number two, it's right by the River Valley. And number three, we keep treading onto their territory. So so what do we expect? I mean, do, do, do humans need to look in the mirror a little bit more often when we approach these types of issues? We talk about pests and nuisances, but who's who really? Well, you know, um, we had a really interesting contribution from Colleen Cassidy St. Clair at U of A about uh, actually examining coyotes' stomachs that had to be put down because one of them in particular killed a dog about three times its size. And the stuff you find in their stomachs shines a light on us, part of a glove, a Tim Hortons wrapper, stuff like that. And there, there's actually emerging evidence that the kind of food that we either deliberately give them or just basically you know, throw on the sidewalk may be influencing their behavior. So those coyotes you see strolling along when you're walking your dog, we're not sure that their behavior is quite like coyotes in the wild. And that's on us. Huh. Nikki, there's uh, and I know it's not just limited. We were talking a few days ago on this show about how as human beings, we're guilty. And and I I just say this as a fact. I don't speculate. I don't wonder. We are guilty of 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 ranking some species and some animals above others when it comes to who we care about. Right. Like like nobody really cares about tuna, uh, but everybody cares about dolphins. Uh, Everybody cares about whales. But but fewer people it seems and it breaks my heart care about sharks uh the podcast has taken on the role that insects play on planet earth right and and that's what a lot of people don't think twice about smacking the insect that lands on their arm but do we need to rethink that yeah well we absolutely do because we're actually seeing really serious declines in insect populations across the globe and it's not just insects it's you know other groups like spiders and that kind of thing And as you probably know, insects are really important to pollination. You know, there's been some estimates that every third bite of food we take is linked to an insect somehow. So it's a pretty important topic. And it's interesting you raise that bit about ranking because it seems so arbitrary. Like, for example, Ryan, would you let a praying mantis like just walk along your hand? 
I'm embarrassed to say I don't remember if they can. They can't hurt me, right? Praying mantis. No, no, <laughs> no they oh. can't hurt you. Oh, sure. I mean, I would love to have a pet praying mantis then. But their okay, closest would, relative, <laughs> their closest relative is a cockroach, and I don't know how you feel about that. But as someone who's accidentally had one run down their leg inside their pants, that does not feel the same, right? Well, we were I was just talking the other day. We have a friend uh, who's a medical researcher. She's brilliant. And she's been doing her work, uh, as a matter of fact, on degenerative brain conditions, she's been doing her work on rats. And we were talking about that just the other day on how people feel differently about rats, whether or not they're in or outside of a lab, whether or not they're white or brown. I mean, r- really, as humans, it's fascinating how our brain works with regards to how we categorize these other living things. You know, one of the fascinating things continuing on the insect theme is that there have actually been studies to show how many fewer insects there are in our environment by actually measuring the number of insects that splatter on a windshield of a car that's been driven a, you know, a standard distance back and forth, different seasons, different weather conditions. And you know, any of us that used to do road trips, uh, say 20 years ago, you know, when you stop for gas, you had to uh, clean the windshield. That's not very common anymore. I'd actually encourage uh, real talkers to check that out this summer. Do you really have to clean your windshield anymore? Maybe not because there are so many fewer insects. Huh? So the ultimate implications of this is are like there's major food chain implications, right? I mean, uh, and, and again, I can't even, you know what? I'm stopping myself. Well, I'll, I'll ask the question. <laughs> I shouldn't ask the question, but it, but it all comes back to what does that mean for us? But that's an incredibly self-centered and egotistical and typical human question to ask, isn't it, Nikki? Yeah, it is, because, I mean, there is a whole ecosystem functioning out there, right? Um, It's a bad news for spiders that insects are in decline because that's what they eat mostly. And it's bad news for birds that eat a lot of spiders and insects. And so there's all these other living things that are really impacted by this issue. Um, Ultimately most of those do come back um, to be a problem for us, though, too. It took me a, a second to track down this tweet of mine. I pushed this out in January, but let, let me just show you this video. And it's grainy because I captured it <laughs> at, at one in the morning. I would just taken out our trash bags, as a matter of fact, for pickup. Oh, cool. But but check out these fellas I'm, I'm for the for those on the podcast that are just listening. I'm, I'm showing you two coyotes that are probably I don't know. What would you what would you say? They're 45 pounds a piece, 50 pounds, comparing them to the size of our black lab. Those are healthy looking Healthy looking coyotes right there smack dab in the middle of the city. Yeah, well, Ryan, we inter- we interviewed this guy last season, Chris Shell. He's a biologist from the States. And he was telling us about this coyote in Chicago that went into a Quiznos, like just went on in there while people were making sandwiches and laid down in front of the drinks. You know, you had to, if you want to get a kombucha, you got to walk by the coyote. And people just did. And it that was fine, apparently. I mean, that's crazy habituation. <laughs> yeah, it's not great. I don't, I've never I haven't been able to tell if everybody's seen the TikTok video. I think it's been on Instagram as well. I don't know if it's real or not about the gal that saw a stray dog and put it in her car and she's bringing it home and sends the video to her <laughs> friends. They, they tell her it's not a stray dog. That's a coyote. You got to get it out of your car. I don't know if that's real. <laughs> hey, so you've got this new episode. Uh, if you're just t- uh, tuning in, if you're live streaming on the Mixler audio app, we're talking to Nikki Wilson and Jay Ingram, hosts of the Anthropomania podcast. Um, this new episode, Resurrection, and a fascinating conversation around de-extincting animals like the woolly mammoth. Is this just something you talk about over beers or is this something that could actually happen? That's a very good question. Actually, yeah. <laughs> um, So, you know, the people involved in this and they include a guy named George Church, who's a really, really outstanding scientist, both at MIT and Harvard. I mean, they're seriously pursuing the idea, but um, I, I would say they've kind of backed off is it really going to be a woolly mammoth if they go through all the intricate steps that you would need to do to bring this back? Or is it what they're now calling an Arctic elephant or somebody called it a mammophant? But the, the thing is, they, they, have, they argue environmental reasons why the Arctic would be a better place, especially in terms of global warming, if you had some of those ancient, huge, hairy, winter-hardened, elephant types tramping on the ground, grazing, maybe turning it into grassland. But the whole project is super long-term and in fact, may not ever work, but it's fascinating. 
That's that's the anthropomania piece of it, right? We all would love to go see woolly mammoths in the north. I mean, it would be cool, but yeah. Nikki, how do we decide if it's the right thing to do? Like, what are some? Are, are, like, do, do we have to? We we can talk about the science side of it. Like, is it actually possible? And then there's the question. I, I feel like I'm just describing the script of Jurassic <laughs> Park. That's basically what I'm doing right now. But there's the question of should we? Yeah. And what's really interesting is, you know, normally Jay and I have, we usually kind of eventually land on some kind of opinion about these things. But I have to say, in this case, we both weren't really sure how we felt. Um, There's some reasonable arguments around the development of this technology, um, even in terms of animals that are on the verge of extinction. So some of this technology could be used to help save those animals or you know, make sure there's some living DNA, like from white rhinos, for example, that um, we can use to bring them back or grow a new population. Um, On the other hand, you know, these technologies are incredibly expensive. Like Paris Hilton was a recent investor in this mammoth project. I think they just got a $60 million infusion. Imagine what that money could do for conservation. So, I mean, there's just a lot going on around this. And I hate to poo-poo it because some amazing things could come from this technology. But I think there are some realities in conservation um, that make me question it a little bit. Yeah. And you've I mean, you've even got to think about things like probably the the social elements. Like if you're going to introduce one, you've kind of got to introduce two or ten. Right. Or something like that. What could it do to the food chain? What disruption could there be to sort of the entire ecology of the region? I think of the, the apex predators that would see a mastodon or whatever we want to call it, an Arctic elephant for the first time. And uh, what that might look like, it'd be like your first time at an all you can eat buffet, I guess, maybe, or, or, <laughs> or maybe not <laughs> might be a rude awakening for them. What is it about the passenger penguin that has you both so fascinated? Yeah. The passenger pigeon. Oh, but, pigeon. Uh, pardon me. So here's the thing. The thing that fascinates me about it is in the mid 19th century, there were an estimated three to 5 billion of these birds. And 50 years later, there were none. And we did that. Random shoot, you you should be, you know, you could point your shotgun as a flock going overhead and just without even looking, kill 20. Uh, So we wiped them out. Well, you know, there's an element of guilt, I think, in wanting to bring them back. Again, there's an environmental argument that the way their enormous flocks kind of flattened parts of the forest led to, you know, a mixed forest, which is a better thing than a uniform forest. Beautiful birds, as you can see there, quite striking, fast flyers. Um, but again, like the Arctic elephant, uh, here's, here's one of the things. These were a very social bird. So you can't just bring back one or two because that would be an animal welfare issue for sure. Um, you got to bring back have them do what you'd like them to do in the forests in the Eastern United States, you'd have to bring back, I don't know, hundred thousand minimum just to have that kind of impact. And that's going to take may, maybe a century. I don't know, but it's, there are, there are people are out there doing it. I'm, I'm trying try- to do it. I'm, I'm trying to just, and I, and I, I recognize who I'm talking to here. Like, you know, both of you have such a, a rich history in, in, in like science and storytelling and all this kind of, and I'm a guy who sort of like, quite frankly, you know, barely made his way through first year university <laughs> biology. <laughs> Most of us had trouble getting through first year, believe me. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm the son of a physician and people always said, you're going to follow in your dad's footsteps. And I always say, well, for, not not as long as they're requiring science. Um, <laughs> but uh, but but I but I do think of, of of the theory or whatever you'd call it, survival of the fittest. And I know that humans have had uh, a devastating impact on a lot of species and humans are responsible for the decline or even the extinction of some species. Um, and then there's also just the way that the world works and species, I guess, come and go and it adds or it introduces or begs that important question um, of, of what should be done when it comes to protecting species. And we talked about the role of zoos the other day and how zoos are having to evolve their mandates 
to remain palatable to people, to remain feasible to people. And a big part of that is 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 restoring species or working on that conservation front. Uh, are we having, uh, Nikki, as, as humans, uh, enough of a conversation or, or a focused enough conversation along these lines, do you think? Well, I think there's lots of conversations, you know, especially um, around climate change and the impacts that's going to have on these species, you know, between that and biodiversity loss, I think there's a lot of awareness. I think the problem is more that taking the actions to protect species or protect their habitats really is in conflict with some of the ways we want to live our lives. And that really is um, a societal question. Like, are we, are we willing to make the changes necessary so that other things can live. And um, in terms of extinctions, yes, species have come and go, but uh, we're seeing extinction at our incredibly fast rate compared to the past, you know, unless a meteor hits you and then, well, that's pretty fast. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's kind of how I want to go, to be quite honest with you. Just yeah. Boom. Blink of an eye. Never saw yeah. it coming. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'd be, be careful what I asked for, but uh, bef- <laughs> b- before we go, it's not just woolly mammoths or, or passenger pigeons uh, that, that you take a look at, but but all elements of nature through that human lens, including um, mushrooms and mold and fungi. And uh, the fact that essentially, whether we like it or not, humans like to think that we're right at the top. We like to think that we rule the world. But, but Jay, maybe that's not exactly the case. Maybe it's mold and yeast and everything else. You know, I, um, I think that's what anthropomania is all about, is that, yeah, we're, we're part of nature, but we're only a part. And even though we're the most populous species in the world, uh, maybe not quite. The chicken is actually, there are way more, there's 23 billion chickens and only like 8 billion humans. But um, yeah, fungi, the things that we pay little attention to, and you, you, relate, you mentioned that earlier, Ryan, uh, Ryan that, you know, we pay attention to big, uh, sexy animals, but we don't care about insects. And we care even less about plants and plants are, are re- being revealed to be fantastic. Fungi, I mean, forests are basically managed and run by fungi. And we're just, we're just starting to realize that. Plus, they're really good to eat. So there you go. <laughs> well, not only that, but Nikki, people are people are giving mushrooms as wedding gifts these days and oftentimes as party favors, too, on along different lines. Right. I mean, prop, maybe one of the most underrated living things on planet Earth. Oh, yeah. I mean, and some of the values like those wedding mushrooms or there's um, this other really valuable. Some of them are thousands of dollars to get your hands on. I mean, I can't wait to get into this. This has been one of the most fascinating episodes to research. Um, we even have a morel hunter who's had some crazy experiences. It's very territorial morel hunting in BC. Morel are those mushrooms that kind of have the really finned um, brown tops that are so delicious to eat. So, uh, yeah, we will do a lot of crazy stuff for mushrooms and fungi. I don't want to spoil anything because I know that you two are taping that episode this week, but I was talking to your producer yesterday and she told me that there's a story with the morels involving somebody with a shotgun, uh, which I thought was fascinating. People are just going to have to subscribe, download, listen to rate, review and share the Anthropomania podcast if they want to learn more about that. Right, you two? Absolutely. <laughs> Couldn't disagree with you, Ryan. We never yeah. disagree with you. Hey, he <laughs> it's uh, honestly so cool to have the both of you on this. We've been looking forward to it uh, ever since we confirmed the booking. Congratulations on the success of the podcast. Uh, we've been talking to multimedia science journalist Nikki Wilson, uh, who writes for like BBC Earth, PBS Nature, Canadian Geographic. Uh, she was associate producer for a top five podcast, Wild Sounds of Canada. And of course, Jay Ingram, you know, Jay from Quirks and Quarks and Daily Planet on Discovery Channel Canada. Uh, He's a member of the Order of Canada with six honorary degrees. Jay, when I hear your voice, I just think science. And I absolutely (laughs) love what the both of you are doing with your podcast. Um, It's the new frontier and it's so exciting. And thank you for making time for us. Um, The uh, the fandom goes both ways. I love what you're doing with Anthropomania. Thanks for talking to us today. Thanks a lot, Ryan. Thanks for what you do too, Ryan. Oh, very cool stuff. Uh, That's Nikki Wilson and Jay Ingram. Have we learned nothing from Jurassic Park? 
I don't know. The whole idea freaks me out a little bit, but but I also don't mind the idea of pushing science to its limits. I know there's ethical red flags everywhere. You can let us know what you think to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Now, every Monday, of course, we present positive reflections in partnership with our friends at Kubi Energy. And we're going to look back to the positive reflections from July 4th. In just a second, it gave us a chance to celebrate a wildly successful inaugural Real Talk Golf Classic in support of the Real Talk Julie Rohr Scholarship. But first, a quick word. Park Power is your friendly local utilities provider. Whether you're looking for electricity, natural gas, or internet, or maybe all three, you owe it to yourself to compare rates today on their website, parkpower.ca. Along with it comes a charitable contribution. What other utilities provider does that? Don't forget when you sign up, the promo code 2022 Real Talk gets you $70 off your first bill from Park Power. Athabasca University is Canada's online university. Their world class accredited online programs and courses offer you the flexibility to learn at your own pace on a schedule that suits your lifestyle. So whether you're looking to upgrade with a certain course or perhaps kick off an undergraduate program, you can do it with the confidence that it's going to suit your lifestyle. Learn more today at AthabascaU.ca. Covenant Health has made a huge difference for patients and their loved ones for more than 160 years. And for 30 years, the Covenant Foundation Lottery has played a role in making a difference for those in their care. Every ticket purchased has a far-reaching impact. Thanks to you, Covenant Health is at the forefront of technological innovations and a leader in palliative and urgent care. Get your tickets today at covenantfoundationlottery.ca. Our friends at Kubi Energy every Monday uh, give us opportunity. Uh, I love this. They pave the way for us to focus on the positives, to find the joy in life, to remind ourselves that amid the heavy stuff, uh, there's a lot going on to restore or maintain our faith in humanity. It's called Positive Reflections. And uh, I'm commandeering positive reflections again. I did it a few weeks ago when Noah Orville was born, and I wanted to show you photos of our new arrival. This time, we want to take you back to the Ranch Golf and Country Club. This is Thursday, June 23rd, our inaugural Real Talk Golf Classic. John, let's just rip. We gave you so many photos. Um, These are all courtesy of Larissa Mack Photography. We're so grateful that she showed up. There's the team from Apex Automation, our dinner sponsors in the house, making sure that we were able to take as much uh, funding as possible and direct it to the Real Talk Julie Rohr Scholarship. So cool to see our friends in there from all different walks of life. We had engineers in the house on the tee box. There's Chad Fletcher, my pal. Loved that he got some of his good buddies out. We had the Real Talk hole. That was hole number four. Hey, the tunes were pounding. We had Northern Chicken there just beside us. There was a lot of action. The cigars. cigars, Not bad. No big deal. The Casa Turret 1973 Torpedoes. Uh, These are our volunteers, thanks to the team at ISL Engineering. Lori in the middle there uh, came in from Devon, Alberta to volunteer. She ended up winning a bottle of Real Talk bourbon for her tweets. She was posting some wonderful photos from the golf course. Our thanks to our friends that made it out there. Uh, The course was playing beautifully. Everybody was having a great time. Of course, there's the team from Reed's Roofing and Insulation. We wouldn't have been able to do this without our sponsors that made sure we could write a big check for the charity. Everybody having fun at the Edmonton Stingers Hole. Sinking three-pointers for prizes. The team at Northern Chicken obviously had everybody slowing down at the seventh tee box to grab a chicken sandwich. I'm not sure how many putts fell on some of these greens. They were tough ones. A lot of familiar faces. That's the Monsma family. Uh, They're out Grand Dog Essentials, quality raw food. Awesome to have them out there joining us. That's David Shore, second from the left, if you're watching on YouTube. That's Julie Rohr's husband and David and his colleagues at ISL Engineering. Just absolutely amazing support of this tournament in honor of Julie. Dram in a can. How cool was that? Just another whole sponsorship from Travis Watt and, and his team at PWS. 
I love this. So many familiar faces. Craig Strain there, Mark Cardinal. Those are the guys behind the Real Talk Pond Hockey Classic that goes every January. Awesome to have them supporting us. Teams like Friesen Brothers we mentioned. We wanted to make sure that there was huge bang for buck for the golfers that paid to be there. Of course, also at the same time, making sure that that scholarship was well-funded. These are our winners here. All right, this is Lane and Dave oh. Sr. and Davis and Keith. They call him Red Bag. They traveled in I from Slave about. Lake and Cochrane. The out-of-towners came in and won the first ever Real Talk tourney. Of course, it was interrupted by rain, and so we had to come up with a scoring system that worked for everybody. Christine Villanueva, our uh, intrepid uh, tournament director, did an incredible job. That's Kate Gallagher of KMG Events who showed up to volunteer her time as well. Uh, you can see here, I mean, uh, smiling face after smiling face. Uh, we got rained out like monsoon style. Nobody seemed to care. The team at the ranch did no. an amazing job with the steak dinner. We got under that one tent where I was DJing oh and gosh. everyone was dancing and eating pizza the and Soho enjoying pizza. cigars and just chatting about the show. It so was... much fun, man. And of course, all of this in support of the Real Talk Julie Royce Scholarship. It was amazing to have Julie's parents joining us, her cousins, and her siblings uh, chiming in and sending us messages of support, even those that couldn't attend, letting us know how much it meant to know that Julie's legacy will continue. I'm happy to let you know that uh, thanks to the sponsors and the amazing people, the volunteers and people that showed up to golf, more than $25,000 goes into that scholarship. That scholarship fund now sitting at about 70 grand. It means wow. that every year $5,000 is going to go to a post-secondary student in Canada that's lost a parent to cancer. Don't forget to circle your calendars for Thursday, June 22nd. 2023 for the second annual Real Talk Golf Classic. We can't wait to see you there. Coming up tomorrow, another edition of the best of Real Talk. We're going to take you back to some of our favorite conversations from the past few months. In the meantime, check out our website, ryanjesperson.com. You can subscribe to our Real Talk Sunday message and email update that's, of course, free to read. And don't miss our merch page where you can pick up your favorite Real Talk gear, including official studio mugs. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Real Talk is hosted by Ryan Jesperson. Executive producer, Josh Dunford. Technical producer, John Hicks. General manager, Katie Cook Chivers. Account Coordinator, Lawrence Durlego. Human Resources, Lena Shepard. Website Design, Mike Johnston. VoiceOver by me, Carrie Skelton. Real Talk's editorial board is Sapria Duvetti, Ahmed Ali, Brandi Morin, Anne Castleman, Corey Hogan, Harmon Candola, Catherine O'Neill, and Chris Henderson. Member Emerita, Julie Rohr. Real Talk is recorded in Edmonton, Alberta on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional and ancestral territory of the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Soto, and Nakota Sioux, home to the Métis settlements and the Métis Nation of Alberta. Real Talk is a relay project. For more, check out ryanjesperson.com.